Hello everyone, Assalamualaikum and a very good day to you. You're still with me, Razia Adam, for JKE 316E Quantitative Economics. And the topics that we'll be doing today is uh, chapter 11 to 13, Hypothesis Testing. In case you forget, our reference is uh, Keller G, okay, 2012, Managerial Statistic, the 9th edition, which is produced by Southwestern Sengage Learning, Mason. While the slide that I'm using is basically from the same Keller G, but from 2009, which is the 8th edition, and all the slide copyright belong to Sengage Learnings. Before we go further, let's recap a couple of uh, formulae that you already covered in the first and the second part. Okay, even the formulae is given, are all given during the uh, exam, if we are interested in talking about exam, but somehow, okay, you need to know the use of the, each formula for which uh, part of the questions. So from part one, okay, I introduce to you the most important parts in terms of data descriptions, Okay, where you can describe data in terms of uh, averages and out of mean, median and mode, okay, the most important averages, measure of averages is what we call as mean. And the formula is, for mean is given as x bar equals to summation of all x value divided by n. Okay? And then you have the standard deviation. So in this case, I put out the formula for variance which is given as uh, x square which is equals to uh, 1 divided by n minus 1, okay, in bracket, you have summation of all x square value, deduct with um, summation of x, in bracket, you square, divide by n, and put everything in bracket, and divide with the first part of the formula, n minus 1. Bear in mind, okay, when I introduce, okay, the x bar and the x square just now, the small s, both are the sample statistic. I do hope that you still remember when we talk about x bar and s squared, Okay, sample statistics are different from the population parameter. So in this case, when we talk about population means, we have mu, and population uh, variance, we have sigma. Okay, so that is the first part. So basically, throughout the, the next topic, hypothesis testing, you still need to remember when we discuss mean and when we discuss variance. And from variance itself, we have... Uh, we can uh, take out the formula, okay, variance, uh, you square uh, variance, so what you have is standard deviation. So in this case, when you take the square root of s square, so you have s, so that is standard deviation. And throughout the formula on the, uh, on the right hand side at the top, what you need to do is put the symbol square root. Okay, that's the first part. And the second part, I introduce to you, okay, the normal probability distributions. That is the most important distributions okay, that you need to assume throughout our discussion. So in this case, I introduced to you the formula for standard normal distributions. Okay, this is what we call as the z-score formula. Okay, z is equal to x minus mu divided by sigma. Okay, so what is x? I hope you still remember that x refer to your random variables. Whatever that you're talking about, it can be in terms of weight of student, it can be in terms of income of a country, it can be in terms of sales value of a company. While mu is referring to the population's mean. Okay, and standard deviation uh, and sigma is referring to the uh, uh, standard deviations of the uh, populations. Okay. And then, I introduce to you at the end of part 2, okay, uh, the first part of uh, statistical inferences. This is where we talk about estimation. In particular, we talk about uh, interval estimation. So, I give you the formula for uh, whether at 95% or 99% uh, confident interval. So, the upper control limit or the lower control limit when it, when it comes to estimate the value for population mean Okay, mu is given as x bar plus minus z alpha divided by 2 multiplied with sigma divided by square root of n. Okay, so what is z alpha divided by 2? So I do hope you still remember when we talk about 95% confidence interval. Okay, we're talking about the tail, okay, at the right, at the left hand side of your normal distribution's uh, bell shaped curve. So what you need to do is 5% tail divided by 2 is 2.5% each. So the z value okay, on the horizontal axis should read at okay, 1.96. And if you are talking about 99% confident interval, the two tail, so 1% divided by 2 is 0.5%, which means the area okay, at one end of the tail is 0 0.005. So you should read the z alpha divided by 2, it should read as 2.58. Okay, just memorize that. 
okay, to make your life easier, okay, and you did, uh, divide uh, or multiply uh, the Z value with the standard error of the sampling distribution, which is given as sigma divided by square root of n. Okay, so with that, basically, we are done with part 1 and part 2, the most important formulae. Okay, alright, so the objective for today's session, basically, I'm going to show to you the fourth step of hypothesis testing. When we talk about the fourth step of hypothesis testing, okay, the first one, okay, what you need to do is set out what is actually your null hypothesis and what is your alternative hypothesis. And the second step, okay, we're going to state the level of significance. From the level of significance, you're going to determine what are the critical value for you to make your decision upon, okay, whether to accept or to reject the hypothesis. And the third step, this is where I'm going to introduce to you more formula, okay, where you're going to calculate the test statistic. And step four, this is where you make your decision, and from your decision, you interpret and you came up with your conclusions. So that's what we are going to achieve at the end of today's session. Okay, before we go further into the different uh, steps in, of hypothesis testing, I'm going to discuss with you the concept of statistical inference. Okay, so when we discuss hypothesis testing, okay, this is the second form of statistical inference. It also has greater applicability, not necessarily in economics, but all in other subjects as well, whether you are discussing sciences, or you are discussing politics management, okay, if you are taking sampling, okay, if you are making decisions, you need to have a hypothesis test. So in this case, to understand the concept, we'll start with an example of a non-statistical hypothesis testing. Okay, let's imagine that you are now in a courtroom, okay, you have a judge, okay, you have the defense team, and you have the prosecutor team, okay, so what's going to happen in a courtroom? We are still talking about a scenario, okay, in a courtroom, okay, the underlying assumption is that uh, the defendant is assumed to be innocent until proven guilty, okay, so in this case, okay, uh, the, the prosecution's team need to prove, okay, beyond a reasonable doubt, okay, whether the defendant is uh, guilty, okay, and in the word of famous jurist William Blackstone, we have that the law holds that it is better that 10 guilty persons escape than one innocent to suffer okay so one case that uh, comes to mind is when we discuss the OJ Simpsons in United States I do not know whether you have come across this case but it's quite famous okay um, so in this case uh, what uh, OJ Simpsons get is actually an acquittal okay but uh, when we know that uh, I, I do not know somehow that everyone know that you know he is, is guilty of the uh, crime so in this case does it mean innocence Okay, so when it comes to the courtroom, okay, it's, uh, what happens is that the, def uh, the prosecution's team need to prove beyond reasonable doubts that the defendant is guilty, then only the law holds that the person is guilty. We are still discussing about non-statistical hypothesis just now. Okay, so a criminal trial is an example of hypothesis testing without the statistic. Okay, this is for you to understand the concept of hypothesis testing only. So in a trial, a jury must decide between two hypotheses. Okay, the null hypothesis, the underlying hypothesis is that what we call as hash naught. Okay, this is where we assume that the defendant is innocent. Okay, and the alternative hypothesis or the research hypothesis that you're going to examine is that hash one where the defendant is guilty. So in this case, the jury, if we're talking about the jury uh, system in United States, Okay, the jury does not know which hypothesis is true. So in this case, the jury must make a decision based on the basis of uh, evidence presented in court. In the language of statistic, convicting the defendant is what we call as rejecting the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative hypothesis. What we are saying is that, or what the jury is saying is that, there is enough evidence to conclude that the defendant is guilty. So in other words, what they are saying is that there is enough evidence to support the alternative hypothesis. Bear in mind, what is H0 just now? We start with the assumption that the defendant is uh, innocent. Alternatively, we have the alternative hypothesis H1, the defendant is guilty. So if you have enough evidence, then only you conclude that the defendant is guilty. We are still discussing non-statistical hypothesis testing and the scenario is still in a courtroom. So what if the jury came out with a verdict of an acquittal? 
Okay, so in other words, the jury is stating that there is not enough evidence to support the alternative hypothesis. Okay, did you notice that the jury is not saying that the, defen the def defendant is innocent, only that there is not enough evidence to support the alternative hypothesis. Okay, when, it, when we go back to the case of O.J. Simpson, I do not have time to elaborate now because that is beyond okay, our syllabus. But if you are interested to, to know further and to understand the concept of hypothesis testing within this case, okay, perhaps you can go and you know, Google from the internet and to find that at the end of the day, okay, at, an acquittal means that there is not enough evidence to support that you know, the defendant is uh, guilty. So in that case, okay, that's why we never say that we accept the null hypothesis. When it comes to hypothesis testing, your decision is always whether you have enough evidence okay, to support the alternative hypothesis. In this case, you are saying that the defendant is guilty. Or in this case, okay, when the jury uh, came up with a verdict on an acquittal, we are saying that there is not enough evidence to support the alternative hypothesis. So in other words, what we are saying is the defendant is innocent. Okay, uh, when we discuss this non-statistical hypothesis testing, there are two possible errors that might happen. Okay, I imagine that you are the judge or you are part of the juries, okay, in that courtroom. Okay, so the first type of error is what we call as a type 1 error. This is an error that occurs when you reject a true null hypothesis. Remember what is our null hypothesis just now? We are saying that the defendant is innocent. Okay, so type 1 error, when you reject that statement that the defendant is innocent, what you are saying is that the defendant is guilty. Okay, what if the defendant is actually innocent? So in that case, you are making a big mistake, so we call that as type 1 error. Okay, so in other words, type 1 error occurs when the jury convicts an innocent person. The person is innocent, but somehow the court finds the person to be guilty of the crime. When we discuss type 2 error, this is the, the error that occurs when you don't reject a false null hypothesis. So in this case, okay, remember what is our null hypothesis just now? Okay, we are stating that the defendant is innocent, but somehow it's false statement. So that means, in other words, the defendant is actually guilty. So in that case, when the courtroom okay, um, uh, find that uh, a guilty defendant is acquitted, that means it's free, okay, okay, no longer guilty of the crime. Okay, so what happened now is a type 2 error. So in this case, okay, between type 1 error and type 2 error, which one that you find is the most serious error? Okay, remember type 1, we are talking about an innocent person okay, become uh, guilty of the crime. Okay, the court find an innocent person somehow guilty of the crime. Second type of error, this is where a guilty defendant is free, okay, uh, is free from, uh, acquitted from the crime. So in this case, definitely type 1 error is the one that is most serious. When we discuss hypothesis testing, the probability of making type 1 error as is what we denote as alpha, okay, that is a Greek symbol, okay, for alpha. Uh, it's not A, but it's alpha. And then the probability of making a type 2 error is what we call as beta. Okay, so that is this, uh, the, the B uh, with uh, a tail there is what we call a grid symbol for beta. The two probability are inversely related. So when you decrease one, that means you increase the probability of making the other type of error. So back to our courtroom example just now. Okay, so in our judicial system, type 1 error are regarded as more serious. Why? Because we are trying to avoid convicting an innocent person. Okay, we are more willing to acquit guilty person. So in this case, we try to arrange to make alpha small by requiring that the prosecution to prove its case and instruct the jury to find the defendant guilty only if and only if there is evidence beyond a reasonable doubt. So this is the, 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 the phrase that you always come across, especially when you, uh, when you watch the, um, the law series. Okay, you need to prove okay, there is evidence beyond reasonable doubt. Okay, so I hope by now you are familiar with the concept of uh, hypothesis testing in terms of there are two hypotheses. Okay, and then we have two types of error. So we want to minimize uh, the probability of 
making uh, error. So in this case, let's go uh, further and discuss hypothesis testing in the context of statistics. So in this case, the critical concept that you are going to come across, okay, uh, next is first, okay, there are two hypotheses, okay, H0, okay, and H1. What is H0? That is your null hypothesis. What is H1? That is your alternative hypothesis. And we always start with assumptions that H0 is true, okay. Uh, just now, okay, in the courtroom, we always assume that the defendant is innocent. So that is the premise of our discussion. Okay, the third point when we discuss hypothesis testing is that the goal is to determine whether there is enough evidence to infer that H1 is true. Okay, so your decision about the hypothesis test will be not on H0 but will be on H1. You, you will uh, assess the evidence, okay, you will examine the evidence on H1 so that you can decide whether there is enough evidence or there is not enough evidence. At the end of the day, you will come up with two possible decisions. Okay, either you conclude there is enough evidence to support H1 or the other way around, you are going to conclude that there is not enough evidence to support the H1. Okay, so take note of the language uh, and the sentence used. The sentence more or less looks the same, okay? But the first sentence, we conclude that there is enough evidence to support H1. The second sentence, we are saying that there is not enough evidence to support H1. So in exam, okay, if, uh, either the word not is there or not there, okay, it makes a lot of difference when it comes to your decision and your conclusions. Okay, so be careful and make sure you write accordingly. And when we discuss the concept of hypothesis testing, okay, is uh, you, we need to take note that there are two possible errors that can be made. Okay, this is the, the one that we discussed earlier, remember? So in this case, probability of uh, type 1 error is what we call as rejecting a true H0. Okay, while the type 2 error is what we call as do not reject a false H0. So probability of making type 1 error is given as alpha. While the probability of making type 2 error is what we call as beta. Okay, let's look at the concept of hypothesis testing one at a time. Okay, so just now I keep on uh, saying that, you know, H0, H1, okay, what are they? Okay, so in this case, okay, we start with two hypotheses. One is what we call as the null hypothesis. Null is referring to zero, okay. So in this case, um, uh, one is null hypothesis and the other is what we call as the alternative or the research hypothesis. The usual notation that we use is HO, but we pronounce somehow as H0. Okay, that refer to the null hypothesis. And the second one is what we call as H1, or we call that alternative hypothesis or research hypothesis. Okay, so in this case, take note that the H0 will always state that the parameter equals the value specified in H1. So H0 will always be the statement of equality. So somehow when you write the information mathematically, you are going to use symbol equal. Okay, so that's the difference between H0 and H1. Okay, let's consider example 10.1 from the textbook. Okay, so example 10.1 is about mean demand for computers, okay, during assembly lead time. This is the same example that I introduced to you, okay, when we discuss normal probability distributions. Okay, so in this case, rather than estimate the mean demand, okay, let's say you now as the operation manager are interested to know whether the mean is different from 350 units, okay. The question is asking you, okay, as operation manager, whether the mean is different from 350 units. So we can replace this request into a test of hypothesis. So how you write this? Okay, because we're talking about mean and the value is 350. So H0, you write as mu equals to 350. And because the phrase is saying that whether the mean is different it does not say that the mean is greater or the mean is less than 350. So because of that, you write your alternative hypothesis or your research hypothesis as H1 mu does not equal to 350. 
So H1 mu does not equal to 350 is the one that you are interested to examine. So the testing procedure will begin with the assumptions that the null hypothesis is true. Thus, until we have further statistical evidence, we will always assume that H0 mu equals to 250, this is a true statement. Under the concept of hypothesis testing, the goal of the whole process is actually to determine whether you have enough evidence to infer that the alternative hypothesis is true. So that is, okay, another way of asking that is there sufficient statistical information to determine that if this statement is true, okay, so that means H1 now mu does not equal to 350. I'm still repeating the concept of hypothesis testing but with regards to the particular example just now. So there are two possible decisions that can be made. Okay, the first decision is for you to conclude that there is enough evidence to support the alternative hypothesis. Okay, this is another way of saying that you reject the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative hypothesis. Okay, on the other hand, okay, it's also possible that you can conclude there is not enough evidence to support the alternative hypothesis. What you are saying is that, okay, you are not rejecting the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative hypothesis. Okay, do take note, we are never going to say that we accept the null hypothesis. It's always either you, in, you have enough evidence or you do not have enough evidence to support the alternative hypothesis. Once the null and alternative hypothesis are stated, the next step is for you to randomly sample the population and calculate the test statistic. Okay, this is where the computation comes in. In this example, you need to calculate the sample mean. Okay, if the test statistic value is inconsistent with the null hypothesis, then we reject the null hypothesis and we infer that the alternative hypothesis is true. Let's go back to the example of mean lead time just now. So in this case, if we are trying to decide whether the mean is not equal to 350, okay, a large value of x bar, say we have x bar equals to 600, would provide enough evidence. But what if x bar is closer to 350, let's say 355? So we could not say whether this, is, uh, whether this provide a great uh, deal of evidence to infer that the population means is different than 350. So in other words, what we are saying is, how can you tell between uh, 600 and 355 whether they are closer to 350 or they are far apart in terms of the distance, in terms of making decisions. We are still discuss discussing the concept of hypothesis testing and the two possible errors that can be made in any test, okay, is a repeat from what we discussed, uh, I discussed with you earlier. So a type 1 error occurs when we reject a true null hypothesis. And a type 2 error occurs when we don't reject a false null hypothesis. And the probability associated with each type of error, okay, P, probability of making type 1 error is given as alpha, while probability of making type 2 error is given as beta. So in this case, alpha is what we call as significance level. So how do we know? When we talk about exam, okay, how do you know that the question is asking you to do hypothesis testing? Because usually, if uh, the question will be stating somewhere in the uh, paragraph, okay, at 5% level of significance, or maybe uh, at 1% level of significance. So that means, okay, this is uh, about hypothesis testing. Okay, when we discuss the different type of error, okay, to make to make it easier for you, I came up with this, not I came up, okay, actually the textbook came up with this metric, okay, if you look at the metric, so you have the, uh, the top row there, okay, in terms of the decisions, okay, uh, about the statement, whether it's true statements or a false statements, T for true, F for false, okay, and then you have the first column under the HO, okay, is in terms of your decisions, okay, your decision can be to reject HO, Okay, or your decision is do not reject HO. So in this case, if you look at type 1 error, okay, this is the error that occurs when you reject a true null hypothesis. So the statement is true, okay, it's under the middle column T, okay, but somehow you reject H0 when it is true. So that is type 1 error. And then we have the second type of error, 
this is the statement is false okay we know that the person is guilty for example but you do not find enough evidence so in this case you do not reject ho so that is what we call as type 2 error this is the error that occurs when we do not reject a false null hypothesis okay uh, the other two box the one shaded okay for example if you look at the middle column if you find that the statement is true okay and then you do not reject so that is not an error it's a true statement and you do not reject hash not okay nothing no problem with that same thing if you have the statement it's a false statement okay and your decision is to reject the, uh, your uh, false statement hash not Okay, so that is also not an error. So we are more concerned about if uh, the statement is true but you reject or if the statement is false but you do not reject. So that is the two type of error Okay, that is possible to happen when you are doing hypothesis testing. Okay, let's discuss uh, the concept that you already gone through just now in the form of an example. So this, uh, this one, I'm going to di uh, discuss example 11.1. From the textbook so what we have in this example is that the manager of a department store is thinking about establishing a new billing system for the store's credit customers so the manager it can be a she or it can be a he or it can be you okay determines that the new system will be cost effective only if the mean monthly account is more than 170 dollar okay so take note of the one that i highlighted in red so, we're talking about mean monthly account more than $170. So, in this case, a random sample of 400 monthly account is drawn for which the sample mean is $178. Okay, so what's the difference just now? Okay, $178 and $170. So, $178 is the sample mean. Well, $170, if this is not the sample mean, then it has to be the population mean that is mu and sample of 400 this represent your sample size n equals to 400 so in this case the manager knows that the account are approximately normally distributed i told you this assumption is very important okay the assumption of normal distributions with a standard deviation sigma equals to 65 dollar so now the question is asking you can the manager conclude from this that the new system will be cost effective okay if you look back the questions what's the definition of cost effective if the mean monthly account is more than 170 dollar so how are you going to write that in terms of uh, symbols okay let's look what happened next okay uh, we are still discussing example 11.1 okay so the first step that you need to do is identify the hash H0 and H1. Okay, so this is the first step of hypothesis te testing. So you know that the system will be cost effective if the mean account balance for all customers is greater than 170. So that is the statement uh, that you need to examine or you need to do research on. So we express this statement or this belief as our research hypothesis. Okay, that means you write that H1 equals to mu greater than 170 why this statement mu greater than 170 cannot be h naught bear in mind i told you earlier h naught must be statement of equality so in that case you write if mu equals to exactly 170 so that is our h naught that is our null hypothesis Okay, so in this case, H0 mu equals to 170. This specifies a single value for the parameter of interest. While mu greater than 170, that is our H1 just now, that is what you would like to determine uh, or you would like to examine. Okay, in example 11.1, okay, uh, in the first step of hypothesis testing where you need to, uh, to identify the, uh, the statements, okay, what you need to do is actually Okay, gather all the information that you can uh, get from the uh, paragraph. So in this case, what we want to show is that H0, where mu equals to 170. Okay, we assume that this is the true statement. Alternatively, we want to test. We are interested to know, okay, uh, further whether H1, the alternative hypothesis, mu greater than 170. So it's cost effective, is mu greater than 170. 
from the questions okay we know that sample size n equals to 400 okay we know that x bar is equals to 178 and we know that standard deviation sigma is given as 65 so what to do next in example 11.1 what you, you need to do next is to compute okay this is where you need to do some calculations so to test your hypothesis we can use two different approach the first approach is what we call as the re rejection region approach this is typically used when computing statistic, uh, statistic manually and the second approach is what we call as p-value approach which is generally used with a computer and statistical software we will explore both approach in turn in example 11.1 okay what you need to do is compute the rejection region so in this case it seems reasonable to reject the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative hypothesis if the value of the sample mean is large relative to 170 that means if x bar is greater than x bar uh, that is given uh, in the sample so in this case if you look at the sketch there okay it's always uh, good for you to do your sketch of a uh, bell-shaped normal distribution curve so in this case you write okay your mu equals to 170 right in the middle okay of your bell-shaped curve so that is your uh, mean okay and and then you find your x bar l so x bar l is actually uh the one that you need to determine and we are talking about the shaded area the probability of uh, falling in that area is what we call alpha okay the probability of making type 1 error so in this case probability of you rejecting h naught given that h naught is true is given as alpha okay equals to probability of x bar greater than x bar l Okay, so you are going to determine what is the exact value of x bar L. So when it comes to computations, what is left for you to do is to actually calculate x bar L and compare it to uh, 170. Okay, remember where does 170 comes from? That is population mean okay, that you uh, get from the uh, information given in the questions. So x bar L is actually your test statistics. So in this case, okay, um, uh, I gave you uh, on screen there something that looks familiar when we do the normal probability distribution as well as when we do estimations. So you have the probability of using the z-score formula, okay, x uh, x minus mu divided by sigma, okay. So x bar just now minus mu divided by sigma, okay. Uh, you need to divide by the square root of n. This is the standard error of the sampling distributions. Okay, if you do that on the left hand side of the one in bracket, you need to do that, okay, to the one on the right hand side inside the bracket. So in this case, x bar minus mu divided by sigma divided by square root of n, that become your z. Okay, so x bar l is something that you do not know. Okay, uh, uh, x, no, it's something that you know. Okay, and you also know mu, you know sigma, and you know your sample size. So what you want is probability of alpha. So in this case, we can calculate okay x bar l okay minus mu divided by sigma divided by square root of n to give to get you the z alpha okay based on any level of significance okay alpha can be five percent remember alpha can be one percent and even alpha can be ten percent sometime even though it's seldomly used. We are still discussing example eleven point one. Let's say, okay, the questions give you the instruction to calculate at 5% level of significance. If it's not stated in the questions, then you can simply make an assumption. So in this case, at 5% level of significance, that means alpha is equal to 0 0.05, what you get is x bar L minus mu divided by sigma divided by square root of n equals to z at alpha. And you know that alpha for 5%, Okay, uh, if you go back to the normal distribution table, table 3 in the appendix, okay, at the back of the, our textbook, okay, for area to the, th uh, to the right hand side, okay, of, uh, which equals to 0 0.05 or 5% tail, so if you need to read, okay, the right hand side, okay, uh, the area under the curve equals to 95% or 0 0.95, what is the value of z on the horizontal axis? The value of z is 1.645. This is one tail. I'm going to explain about one tail or two tail further after this. 
So in this case, okay, what you have is x bar L minus, okay, what is mu? You put that in, 170. What is sigma? Sigma is 65. What is square root of n? n is 400. And you know that the area of alpha now, okay, z uh, at 0 0.05 is 1.645. So in this case, what you get is x bar L is 175.34. This is your critical value, okay? So in this case, bear in mind, okay, your population mean, okay, is 178. Uh, 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 your sample mean is 178. So sample mean 178 is definitely greater than the critical value that you calculated just now at 175.34. Okay? So the decision is you reject the null hypothesis in favor of H1. So that means what you're saying is that mu is greater than 170. Then it that it is cost effective to install the new billing system. Okay? So remember, this is the decision. You reject the null hypothesis. Why you reject the null hypothesis? Because you already calculated your test statistic, x bar L. x bar L 175.34 is greater, is less than uh, 178, okay, sample means. So that means you can conclude it is cost effective to install the new billing system. Using the first approach, so this is the big picture. As usual, I always uh, told my student, you need to sketch. You need to sketch. I don't care about your, your graph. It's perfectly symmetrical. But let's assume that your sketch, okay, something like this bell-shaped curve. Okay, put down your mean. Okay, put down your 178. Okay, S bar equals to 178 sample mean just now. Okay, you are not sure whether 178, is it big enough, the 170, or whether it's really close to 170. So remember, okay, 170 is the population mean, while 178 is the sample mean. So in this case, okay, the, the first approach, okay, tells you need to calculate x bar L. So using the formula, okay, and given that alpha equals to 5%, that means the tail, okay, area to the right-hand side is 0 0.05, and area to the left, okay, the non-shaded area is 0 0.95 or 95%, so you read the value of Z at that point, okay, is given as 175.34. So in this case, your 178 is falls in the rejection region. Okay, so the shaded area represents rejection region. The non-shaded area represents acceptance region. So in this case, your decision, looking at your sketch just now, looking at the fact that your X bar, 178, is greater than 175.34 so if for the rejection region your decision is reject H0 in favor of H1 so that means the statement that you are uh, agreeing now is H1 mu is greater than 170 okay the second approach is actually much easier so we call this as the standardized test statistic Okay, so what you need to do, okay, uh, is to actually calculate or to use the standardized test statistic. Look at the formula. This is something more or less similar to the uh, z-score formula in normal probability distribution as well as confidence level estimation. So what we have is z equals to x bar minus mu divided by sigma divided by square root of m. Be careful in exam, okay, what you need to do is Okay, solve the numerator first. Okay, x bar minus mu, what do you get? Okay, put it aside. Okay, and then you need to solve the denumerator, sigma divided by square root of n, whatever it is, put it aside. Then only you divide denumerator, okay, over the denumerator. Okay? So in this case, what you need to do is compare your standardized test statistic just now, okay, the result with a z alpha. So this is z alpha, the rejection region. So in this case, okay, using the z-score formula, you replace the value, okay, x bar 178, mu 170, sigma 65, n equals to 400, put it into the formula. Okay, let's say you do it uh, wrongly, you calculate 178 minus 170, divide by 65, then only you divide by square root of 400, you won't get the same answer as mine. Okay, so that means what you need to do is, 178 minus 170, you get 8. Okay, put it aside. 
Okay, square root of 400 is what? 65 by, divided by square root of 400, you get something. Then only 8 divided by the answer, then you get 2.46. And then you know from uh, when you have one tail with a rejection re uh, re uh, area of 0 0.05, the Z value at 0 0.05 tail is 1.645. But somehow just now you calculated that Z equals to uh, 2.46. Definitely 2.46 is greater than 1.64. So your decision is you reject H0 in favor of H1. Okay, so this is the standardized test statistic approach. Okay, using the second approach, uh, still example 11.1, .1, this is the big picture again. Okay, uh, using the standardized uh approach okay what happened is you you do the sketch the normal bell shaped curves okay so remember your mu in the middle is no longer 170 but now this is for zero okay and you know that at, when the shadow area the tail one tail okay because the symbol greater than is 0 0.5 so you read the critical value at that point is z at alpha 0 0.05 is 1.645 and the Z that you calculated just now is equals 2.46. It falls within the rejection region. So because of that, you make decision, reject H0 in favor of H1. So you are accepting the alternative hypothesis. Let's look at now the p-value of a test. The p-value of a test is the probability of observing a test statistic at least as extreme as the one computed given that the null hypothesis is true. In the, in the case of our department store example, okay, you are interested to find, for example, what is the probability of observing a sample mean at least as extreme as the one already observed. In other words, x bar equals 278. Given that the null hypothesis has not mu equals 270 is true. In the case of our department store example, what is the probability of observing a sample mean at least as extreme as the one already observed? In other words, x bar equals 278. Given that the null hypothesis H0 mu equals 270 is true. So in this case, you need to put all the information okay, into the formula. So probability of x bar greater than 178 is equals to probability of uh, Z score formula, X bar now, okay, minus mu divided by sigma divided by square root of m, okay, and then 178 minus mu, uh, 170 divided by 75 divided by square root of 400. So you get to write that as probability of Z greater than 2.46, okay. So the probability of Z greater than 2.46 is equals to 0 0.0069. So this is the actual probability. So we call this the uh, we call this as the p-value of a test. Looking at the big picture in terms of the p-value of a test approach. Okay, for z greater than two point four six, you can see that on the screen. Okay, the probability is very very small. Okay, it, it refer to the shadow area in red to the right hand side of your curve. Okay, where the area, okay, the p-value stood at 0 0.0069. This is less than 1%. So the critical point for you to decide is 2.46. Z equals to 2.46. How do we interpret the p-value actually? So the idea is that the smaller the p-value, okay, the smaller the probability, the more statistical evidence exists to support the alternative hypothesis. Okay, so if the p-value is less than 1%, what you are saying is that there is overwhelming evidence to support the alternative hypothesis. If somehow your p-value is between 1% and 5%, this is where you use uh, that 5% um, level of significance, what you are saying is that there is a strong evidence to support the alternative hypothesis. If your p-value, okay, if you are between 5% and 10%, that means you are using the 10% level of significance, okay, there is a weak evidence that support the alternative hypothesis. If the p-value is greater than 10%, there is no evidence that support the alternative hypothesis. So when we talk about the level of significance, basically, if we are using 1% level of significance, 
and you find that you know you reject H naught in favor of H one. So this is where you have overwhelming support or overwhelming evidence. Okay, very strong evidence to support H one. If you use five percent level of significance, you are finding, in other words, there is a strong evidence to support the H one. And ten percent, there is only a weak evidence to support the H one. And if you have uh, you, uh, uh, less than ten percent or greater than p value greater than ten percent, that means level of significance less than ten uh, percent. There is uh, no evidence that support the alternative hypothesis. So in this case, back to earlier example, the p value approach. If you observe a p value of point zero zero six nine. Hence, there is overwhelming evidence. You use you can use that word actually. There is strong evidence is uh, not is enough. You can use overwhelming evidence to support that H one mu is greater than hundred seventy. Now we are discussing uh, the big picture when it comes to the interpretation of the p value. So you see on screen we have a range of value. Okay, in terms of level of significance from zero. To zero point zero one, to zero point zero five, to zero point one, okay. So if you have probability, okay, between zero and point zero one, okay. For example, just now what you have is probability point zero zero six nine. It's very small. It fall between that region zero and point zero one. So you can say that is highly significant or overwhelming evidence. If you have your probability that falls between point zero one and point zero five, that means very very small probability of that to happen still. So you can say it's strong evidence or just significant evidence. And if you have probability fall within the region of point zero five and point ten, okay, or point one, okay, you say that there is a weak evidence and not significance. While anything beyond that is what we say as no evidence or not significant at all. We are still discussing in terms of interpretation of the p-value. So in this case, let's compare the p-value with the selected value of the significance level. If the p-value is less than alpha, alpha is referring to the significance level. I hope you still remember that. So you judge that the p-value is to be small enough to reject the null hypothesis. If the p-value is greater than alpha, so we do not reject the null hypothesis. So it's just a repeat of what we discussed earlier. So since our p-value in this case is equals to point zero zero six nine, this is less than alpha at point zero five. I do hope you can differentiate that. You know, point zero zero six nine is smaller in term of measurement than point zero five. Okay, bear in mind the decimal places there. So in this case, we reject H O or we reject H naught in favor of H one. When it comes to the computation, as usual, we can use the software available, okay, uh, to use with Excel, okay, the data sets. It can be uh, taken from the text as well. So I'm going to skip this part about computations, okay. But basically, you can use Data Analysis Plus in order for you to test means in term of hypothesis testing. If you do the test just now, okay, uh, using statistical software uh, in Excel, data analysis, okay, this is the result that is produced. Okay, it stated that Z test for mean. Okay, and mean equals one hundred seventy eight. That is your mu standard deviation sixty eight point three six. Is your sample standard deviation observation four hundred hypothesis hypothesis mean is one hundred seventy. That is mu one hundred seventy eight. Is x bar just now? Sigma is sixty five. Z stat Z statistic is the critical values. Okay, two point four six probability of Z less than Z. Okay, it's zero point zero six nine. Okay, that is one tail, and then you have two tail. Okay, it's different value. That one I will discuss afterwards. Okay, so basically, whatever that you calculated just now can be done easily using a software. Don't forget. Okay, at the end of uh hypothesis testing, you need to make a conclusions. So in this case, if you reject the null hypothesis. We conclude that there is enough evidence to infer that the alternative hypothesis is true. Okay, if you do not reject the null hypothesis, then you can conclude there is not enough statistical evidence to infer that the alternative hypothesis is true. Okay, it looks like the statement is similar, but they are not the same. Okay, you must remember 
The alternative hypothesis is the more important one. It represents what you are investigating, what you are actually examining. Okay, just now I keep on saying one tail test, two tail test, what are they all about? Okay, how do you know your hypothesis test is actually one tail or whether it's a, actually a two tail test? So in this case, if we look at example 11.1, .1, okay, the department store exam, uh, example, it was a one tail test because the rejection region is located in only one tail of the sampling distributions. So how far 5% or that 5% stood to the right hand side of your X bar L. Okay, so more correctly, this is what we call as an example of a right tail test. If you look at uh, another example in the text, okay, the SSA envelope example, that one is a left tail test because the rejection region was located in the left tail of the sampling distribution. Okay, so as I told you, okay, when you look at uh, any questions on hypothesis testing, okay, what you need to do? Sketch. You need to sketch. Put in all the information, then only you see whether it's a right tail or it's a left tail, what are the critical values and so on and so forth. When it comes to the right tail test, actually there is a clue for you. Okay, how do you know that the, uh, the test is a right tail test? Okay, look at your hypothesis. In particular, look at your H1. Okay, remember H0 is always statement of equality, so it doesn't tell you anything because it's statement of equality. Look at H1. So in this case, H1 is where you have mu greater than mu zero. So that means the, the symbol greater than tells you that it's a right tail test. Okay, whatever the critical point there. Okay, so for 5% shaded area beyond the critical point. So that is uh, the tail that you are looking for. So that is your rejection region. While the rest, the non-shaded area is the acceptance region. If you look at the example on left tail test, the SSA envelope in the textbook, okay, the clue is given the same thing in your H1, where mu is less than mu zero. So in this case, okay, if you have H1, mu less than mu something something, then what you need to do is sketch, okay, and put your shaded area to the left of the normal bell-shaped curves. Okay, so your alpha, let's say 5%, so the whole tail of shaded area 5% will fall on your left. Okay, while the right hand side of that, your 95% is the acceptance region. We are done with discussing one tail or two tail test. It's possible that the test is asking you for two tails. Okay, so two tail testing is used when you want to test a research hypothesis that a parameter is not equal to. So if you read in the question, it does not say greater than, it does not say uh, less than, it only say not equals to or different from. So that's the key word, not equal or different to some value. So in that case, you know that, oh, this is two tail test. So if you are given a 5% level of significance, that 5% rejection area, you need to divide or you need to split into two. Half of it, okay, on the right hand side, the other half of it is on the left hand side. So look at your null hypothesis there. Your null hypothesis is mu does not equal to mu whatever. Okay, so you have your shaded area falls on the two tails, right hand side and left hand side. So I'm going to discuss these two tails in terms of example 11.2. Okay, for two tail test, okay, in, uh, in example 11.2, you are given the information that in recent years, a number of companies have been formed that offer competition to AT&T in long distance call. Okay, this is a telco company in the United States. So all these uh, competitors, okay, advertise that their rates, okay, in terms of phone call rates, are lower than AT&T's. And as a result, their bills will be lower. So, okay, with, with, with respect to these competitions, so AT&T has responded by arguing that for the average consumer, there'll be no difference in billing. So suppose that a statistic practitioner, that means it can be you, it can be me now, okay, working for AT&T, okay, determines that the mean and standard deviation of monthly long distance bills for all its residential customers are $17.09 and $3.87 respectively. So that means mean 
uh, mean is 17.09, standard deviation is 3.87 respectively. In order to do the hypothesis testing, okay, in example 11.2, the statistic uh, practitioner then takes a random sample of 100 customers, so N equals to 100, okay, and recalculate their last month's bills using the rate quoted by the leading competitors. So assuming that the standard deviation of this population is the same as for AT and T, can we conclude? Okay, this is the question, the most important questions now. Can we conclude at the five percent significance level that there is a difference between AT and T bills and those of the leading competitors? So this is the statement that you are asked to examine. Let's look at the first step of hypothesis testing. For you to identify what is your mu, uh, what is your null hypothesis, what is your alternative hypothesis. So in this case, okay, the parameter to be tested is the mean of the population of AT and T's customers' bills based on the competitor's rate. So what we want to determine is whether this mean, okay, uh, for AT and T customer differ from seventeen point oh nine dollar. Thus, the alternative hypothesis is. Okay, H1 mu does not equals to 17.09. Okay, under uh, we understood automatically that the null hypothesis H0 mu equals to 17.09 dollar. You can ignore the symbol, okay, when it comes to the calculation. Okay, the second step of hypothesis testing in example 11.2, you still need to identify. Okay, this is where you need to sketch. Just now, okay, based on the null hypothesis, okay, and the uh, H1, okay, mu does not equal to mu something. So, you know that it's a two-tail test. So, in this case, the rejection region is set up so that we can reject the null hypothesis when the test statistic is large or when the test statistic is small because it's two-tail. Okay, so you have uh, the sketch there on the screen. So, you have the right-hand side, okay, where the statistic is large and you have the left-hand side in the shaded area where for the statistic is small. So, in that is, we set up a two-tailed rejection region. The total area in the rejection region must sum equals to alpha. So, alpha divided by 2, so that is the, uh, 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 the region uh, of rejection. Okay, at 5% level of significance, that means alpha equals to 0.05 okay for two tail that means you need to divide alpha divided by two so alpha divided by two you get 0 0.025 so when the critical value uh, when the rejection uh, the rejection region is 0 0.025 so you need to read okay what is the crit uh, the value of z so z for area 0 0.025 you read that as 1.96 if you do not know how we get 1.96 from the table, please look at part 2 when we study normal probability distribution. And when we study, okay, 95% confidence interval, okay, remember 95% confidence interval, okay, you have an interval between a lower class limit and upper class limit at 95% area. So the, the critical point is 1.96. So same thing here. Okay, 1.96 can be positive for the upper rejection region, okay, on the right-hand side, and negative 1.96 for the lower rejection region on the left-hand side. Okay, so you do the sketch, and you, you can show it on screen. Okay, so it's the same formula, okay, at the bottom there from the 95% confidence interval. Okay, the second step, or the third step in hypothesis testing is actually for you to compute. Okay, from the data set given in example 11.3, okay, you can calculate man manually or you can calculate using the computer, you will get X bar equals to 17.55. And then using our standardized test statistic, the Z-score formula, where X bar minus mu divided by sigma divided by square root of N, okay, you replace the value that you get just now, okay, X bar is 17.55, Mu is 17.09, you get that from the questions. Sigma 3.8587 is also from the question. Sample size 100 is also from the questions. Solve the numerator, then the denumerator, divide both. What you get is Z equals to 1.19. Okay, 
So in this case, compare Z equals to 1.19. This is your test statistic. Compare it with your critical point in step 2 just now, which is 1.96. So def uh, definitely you find that 1.19 is not greater than 1.96. No less than negative 1.96. So because of this, okay, we cannot reject the null hypothesis in favor of H1. What we're saying is that there is insufficient evidence or you can say that there is no evidence to infer that there is a difference between the bills of AT&T and the competitors. Using the second approach, okay, the p-value approach in this example for two-tail hypothesis testing. Okay, in general, the p-value in a two-tail test is determined by 2 multiply with probability of Z greater than a uh, modular Z. Modular Z, that means you ignore the negative. That, that uh, goal sign uh, in, uh, okay, outside of Z represent ignore the negative. What is Z? Small Z is the actual value of the test statistic and modular Z is the absolute value. Ignore the sign, negative. So in example 11.2, the p-value is equal to 2 multiplied with probability of z greater than 1.19. So 2 multiplied with 0 .11, uh, 0 0.1170, you get probability of 0 0.2340. So this is not significant. Okay, in example 11.2, okay, as usual, you can ask your computer okay, to do the computations. I'm going to skip this as well. For example, 11.2 just now, if you use your software in the computer to compute, okay, this is the result that you get. It's still a z-test for means, okay, you have the sample, uh, popul uh, the population mean, 17 point, uh, samples uh, mean, okay, x-bar 17.55, standard duration 3.94, n equals 200, Mu equals to 17.09, sigma 3.87, okay, Z step 1.19, but that one is for uh, one tail, okay, but what you need to look for now is the two tail probability of Z. So that is given as 0.2346, so it's not significant. And if you are uh, looking at the cr uh, critical value of Z at the two tail, it's 1.96. So when you know that it's a two tail test, so then you know that you need to read the value of probability of Z for two tail and Z critical for two tail, not one tail. Okay, Okay. let's look at the summary of what we discussed just now with regards to the one tail and the two tail test. Okay, uh, if you look at the one in the middle, okay, this is what we call the two tail test. Okay, the symbol that you need to use, okay, H0, mu is always equals to whatever mu that is given. Okay, alternatively, H1, mu does not equals to that is the equal symbol with a slash it means that does not equals to it means it's different okay when you sketch okay then you have the two tail okay whatever the level of significance whether it's one percent okay you need to divide by two so each tail is 0 0.5 percent or 0 0.005 or if we are using the five uh, percent level of significance divided by two so each tail is 2.5 percent or 0 0.025 okay so that is for the two tail test the key word that you need to look for when you read the information that is given in the question is the word different or equality or does not equals to okay so then you know this is the symbol that you need to use equality and uh, not equal symbol and it's a two tail test on the other hand if the question says that you know uh, it's less than or decreasing or something uh, to the same meaning so in that case you need to write your hash naught okay still the same hash naught but your hash one you need to write mu is less than whatever that is mu given and then you need to sketch your tail your one percent or your five percent level of significance okay the shadow area to the left hand side of your graph okay if you look at the right uh, the right tail test for one uh, for one tail okay the keyword that you need to look for in the question is greater than or more okay and you need to sketch your tail on the right hand side either for one percent or for the five percent level of significance okay so this is the summary of one and two tail tests that we discussed so far
the next part that I'm going to discuss is a little bit advanced. Okay, you can skip this part if you want to, but I suggest you just uh, uh, keep with me for the next few uh, slides. Okay, now let's discuss. Okay, how we de develop an understanding of statistical concept. Okay, as is the case with the confidence interval estimator. The task of hypothesis is based on the sampling distribution of the sample statistic. Okay, we already discussed this in part 2, okay, where I discussed with you the sampling distribution, chapter 9. The result of a test hypothesis is a probability statement about the sample statistic. So remember when we discussed inferential statistic, so hypothesis testing is part of it. Okay, you make a probability statement okay about the population parameter based on sample statistic so here we assume that the population mean is specified by the null hypothesis we then compute the test statistic and determine how likely it is to observe this large or how small a value when the null hypothesis is true if the probability is small we conclude that the assumptions that the null hypothesis is true is then unfounded and we reject it. Okay, now when we discuss an understanding of the statistical concept, okay, what we do next is for the computer or for you to manually calculate the value of the test statistic. Okay, using the z-score formula, okay, uh, with a, a little bit of adjustment. So z is equals to x bar minus mu divided by sigma divided by square root of n. So the bottom part of the formula is uh, what we call as the standard error of the sampling distributions. Okay, we are also measuring the difference between the sample statistic then and the hypothesis value of the parameter. And the unit of measurement of the difference is the bottom part of the formula which I referred to just now as standard error. In example 11.2, we found that the value of the test statistic was z equals to 1.19 okay this means that the sample mean was 1.19 standard error above the hypothesized value the standard normal probability table told us that this value is not considered unlikely as a result we did not dis uh, reject the null hypothesis the concept of measuring the difference between the sample statistic and the hypothesized value of the parameter in terms of the standard error is one that will be used frequently throughout this book or throughout the course. Now we are going to discuss the probability of type 2 error. The probability of type 2 error is given as beta. Okay, that's the symbol B with the tail there for beta. It is important that we understand the relationship between type 1 and type 2 error. That is how the probability of type 2 error is calculated and what it uh, how do we interpret type 2 error? Let's recall example 11.1. So we have h0 mu equals to 170. And then we have h1 mu greater than 170. At levels of significance of 5%, we reject h0 in favor of h1. Why? Because our sample mean, okay, 178 is greater than or was greater than the critical value of x bar which is given as 175.34 so a type 2 error occurs when a false null hypothesis is not rejected so back to exam example 11.1 this means that if x bar is less than 175.34 okay this is our critical value so we will not reject our null hypothesis which means that we will not install the new billing system. So we can say that beta is equal to probability of x bar is less than 175.34 given that the null hypothesis is false. The value of beta okay, is given as probability of x bar less than 175.34 given that the null hypothesis is false. Okay, These conditions only tells us that the mean does not equal to 170. So we need to compute beta for some new value of mu. For example, suppose that if the mean account balance is $180, the new billing system will be so profitable that we would hate to lose the opportunity to install it. Okay, 
So in this case, we calculate beta equals to probability of x bar less than 175.34 given that mu now is equal to $180. Thus, what we have, okay, replace into the formula, okay, using the z-score formula, probability of x bar, okay, minus mu divided by sigma divided by square root of m. So that becomes probability of z. Okay, uh, replace the x bar, 175.34. Mu, 180, sigma, 65, uh, 180 is the new one, okay, and then uh, sample size is 400, okay, so what you get is probability of Z less than negative 1.43, okay, so go back to the normal distribution table, you do read what is the probability when Z is less than negative 1.43, what you get the area under the uh, under the the curve is 0.0764. We are still discussing example 11.1. Okay, if you look at the the sketch on top, okay, that is our original hypothesis. Mu equals to 170, and you have the rejection area 5%. Okay, alpha equals to 0 0.05, and the critical point of x. Uh, X bar that is given as 175.34 So in this case, okay, with a new sketch With the new assumption, okay, mu equals to 180 Okay, with the same amount of uh, shaded area Okay, with beta equals to 0 0.0764 Okay, so you, uh, that is for mu equals to 180 Now, we are going to look at the effect on beta As a result of changing alpha Okay so decreasing the significance level of alpha will increase the value of beta and vice versa. So let's change alpha from 5% just now to 1% or 0 0.01 in example 11.1. .1. So stage 1, okay, if we look at the rejection region, okay, so the rejection region, okay, for Z greater than Z alpha, alpha now is Z for 0 0.01. So you are going to read the value of Z is 2.33. You get that from the table. Okay, so in this case, okay, you calculate the standardized Z-score va uh, value, okay, using the formula. Okay, so what you get is X bar is greater than 175.57. So this is uh, what you need to do for the rejection region. We are still discussing the effect of on beta as a result of changing alpha. As I told you just now, decreasing the significance level, okay, alpha, will increase the value of beta and vice versa. Let's look at the diagram that is shown on screen. Okay, shifting the critical value to the right, okay, by, uh, that, uh, in other words, to decrease alpha, will means a larger area under the curve for beta, okay, and vice versa. So you can see that on screen. Okay, how do we judge our test? Okay, so in this case, a statistical test of hypothesis is effectively defined by the significance level, that is alpha, and the sample size n, both of which are selected by the statistical practitioner. So therefore, if the probability of type 2 error beta is judged to be too large, we can reduce it by either increasing alpha or n, Increasing the sample size. Okay, so remember when we talk about how do we reduce probability of making a type 2 error, you need to increase your level of significance or you need to increase your sample size. When we discuss in terms of judging the hypothesis test just now, okay, for example, suppose we increase, uh, we increase N, the sample size, from 400 to 1000. Okay, we are still using example 11.1. So if you look at stage 1, the rejection region, so now you calculate uh, Z, the critical point at 0 0.05, the critical point, one tail test, you get uh, 1.645. And then, okay, the test statistic, okay, you replace that value, okay, what do you get is X bar is greater than 170.38. Okay, stage 2, when it comes to probability of making a type 2 error, we need to calculate beta now. So probability of beta is given as X bar less than 173.38 for mu equals to 180. So in this case, replace the Z-score formula, replace all the values accordingly. What you get is probability, uh, uh, probability of Z less than negative 3.22. 
Okay, you go to the table and you know that the table can only read up to the value of negative 3.09. Okay, so beyond that, we can assume probability of Z uh, beyond the 3.09 is 0. So that is an approximation. Okay, the slide that you're looking to now is comparing beta when n equals the 400 and n equals to 1000. So this is the two different sample size. Initially, we start with sample size of 400, then we move on with n, okay, sample size equals to 1000. So you say that by increasing the sample size, we reduce the probability of making type 2 error. So the top uh, uh, pair of graph shows that uh, beta probability of making type 2 error is equals to 0 0.0764 okay as a result of increasing sample size for the same level of significance okay alpha equals to 0 0.05 your beta now is approximately zero so that means if you need to reduce the probability of making type 2 error increase your sample size so the calculation of the probability of type 2 error for sample size 400 and for sample size 1000, does illustrate, uh, illustrate a concept whose importance cannot be overstated. By increasing the sample size, we reduce the probability of type 2 error. By reducing the probability of type 2 error, we make this type of error less frequently. So remember, okay, when we talk about uh, data collection in part 2, you always need to balance the need between increasing your sample size in order to uh, improve the quality of your inference, the quality of your uh, estimate against, okay, at the same time, you want to make sure that your cost does not inflate as well. So there is a, uh, a need to strike a balance between increasing the sample size and, okay, reducing the cost, okay? By reducing uh, the probability of type 2 error, I already mentioned this, okay we want to make uh, the error occurs less frequently so hence we can make better decision in the long run so this finding lies at the heart of applied statistical analysis and reinforce the book first sentence statistic is a way to get information from data statistic is just a tool you want to get information from raw data Okay, throughout the discussion, okay, I already introduced to you a variety of application, okay, in the textbook, especially if you uh, read all the examples, okay, application in finance, application in marketing, okay, uh, operation management, human resource management, as well as economics. In all such applications, the statistic practitioner must make a decision which involves converting data into information. The more information, the better is the decision. Without such information, decision must be based on guesswork, instinct and luck. So a famous statistician, uh, Edward Deming said, it is best, okay, without data, you are just another person with an opinion. So a statistician always back up data, uh, or back up your opinion with data. Okay, another thing that you need to know when we discuss hypothesis tests is about the power of a test. Okay, another way of expressing how well a test performs is to report its power. Okay, the power of a test refers to the probability of it leading us to reject the null hypothesis when it is false. Thus, the power of a test is, for example, when more than one test can be performed in a given situation, we would naturally prefer to use the test that is correct more frequently. Okay, so if given the same alternative hypothesis, sample size and significance level, one test has a higher power than a second test, the first test is said to be more powerful. Okay, when we judge the test, okay, the power of the test is defined as 1 minus beta. So it represents the probability of rejection rejecting the null hypothesis when it is false okay for example when more than one test can be performed in a given situation it is preferable to use the test that is correct more often if one test has a higher power than a second test the first test is said to be more powerful than the preferred test okay so basically i'm going to uh, wrap up your understanding of hypothesis testing i do hope you understand that hypothesis testing involves the different steps where you need first to state the uh, the hypothesis uh, test in terms of uh, null hypothesis and alternative hypothesis 
You need to find the critical values. You need to do the uh, test statistic calculation. And then you have to make decision before you actually uh, come to conclusion. So you need to put all this uh, information, what you learned today, into practice. Okay, by, look, by practicing on the question that is given in the textbook. Okay, this is the road ahead for you. Okay, the ICI approach. Okay, in terms of identify. Okay, in terms of compute and in terms of interpret. Okay, uh, when, it, when it comes to exams, okay, I have students who have difficulty, for example, to identify whether the question is asking for you to do uh, confidence level estimation or the question is asking you to do a hypothesis testing. Okay, because uh, the identification of the correct methods means you will be using the correct steps, the correct formula. Computation is also another thing that students need to pay close attention in terms of the division, multiplications, okay, what is on top should be solved, okay, what sh uh, on the bottom part the formula should be solved, okay. And the last part, interpretation is where, okay, students tend to lose mark. Okay, it's possible that you use the correct formula, you identify the correct technique, okay, you compute, okay, uh, the correct figure, but somehow you, you fail to make it understood, okay, what does it mean, those figures that you calculated just now. Okay, so the most difficult part of statistics in real life and a final exam is to identify the correct techniques. Okay, so let's recap the objective of today's session so far. I already introduced to you, okay, the first type of hypothesis testing. Okay, first, you need to set up your null hypothesis and your alternative hypothesis. Okay, be careful. Okay, this is also the stage where you need to identify is a one-tail or two-tail test based on the uh, question itself. Okay, if you're given a clue in terms of less than, in terms of uh, more than, or in terms of different from, so it tells you, okay, whether it's one-tail or it's two-tail, right-hand side or left-hand side. Okay, from there on, you can calculate the level of significance and the critical value. Usually, the level of significance is given as 1% uh, or 5% often time. And from there on, you move on to the next step where you need to calculate the test statistic using formula. Okay, and from there, you can make decision whether to accept or to reject. Okay, and what is the conclusion will be basically the interpretation of your questions. Okay, this is a summary of step one, okay, for hypothesis testing, okay, uh, this is a clue for you actually, okay, when it comes to setting out the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis, you need to identify, okay, quickly whether it's a one tail or it's a two tail, okay, if a one tail means, okay, you need to pay attention to the word greater than, okay, or more than, okay, or other sim uh, words uh, si with similar meaning. Then your H1 will be using the symbol greater than. If you come across the word less than or uh, what is less than? Decreasing. Then you need to use H1 okay, with a symbol less than. If you come across the word different from or does not equals to, then your H1 should be okay, the not equal symbol okay, equal with a slash. In step 2 of hypothesis testing, okay, when it comes to uh, the level of significance and the associated critical values, okay, usually I ask my student, okay, when it comes to hypothesis testing, because there are so many steps involved, if you can memorize these uh, values, okay, you make your life easier. Okay, no need to every time okay, you need to go back to the normal distribution table. So in this case, usually okay, uh, it's given in the equations as 5% uh, level of significance, or one percent of level of significance. Seldomly, okay, a statistical practitioner use ten percent level of significance, but it's also possible. So in this case, if you are given one percent level of significance for two tail, okay, the value that you have to remember for, uh, in terms of critical value is two point five eight. Okay, so if uh, one tail on the right hand side, uh, two point five eight positive. If uh, one tail on the left hand side, 2.58, it becomes negative. Okay. Similarly, when it comes to uh, two tail, okay, for 1% level of significance, two tail, 1% divided by 2 and the area, okay, so you get critical value 3.09. Okay, so that is for 1%. If we're talking about 5% level of uh, significance, for one tail, okay, the critical value of Z will be 1.64. Okay. 
and two tail okay uh, will be 1.96 plus minus okay just now one tail okay 1.64 uh, the critical value for z will be positive if the tail on the right hand side will be negative if the tail is on the left hand side so simplify your life memorize this okay so you can use it okay in step two uh, in step three of hypothesis testing where you're supposed to do the calculation okay for test statistic i want to introduce to you only one formula so far okay you are we are doing hypothesis testing for mean it's also possible that we can do hypothesis testing for proportion and just now i introduced to you okay large sample but remember in part two i already discussed with you other than normal distributions okay we also have student t distribution for small sample so instead of looking at z table for normal you need to look at t table for student t distribution so uh, when, it, when we discuss student t distributions the formula is uh, more or less the same except that instead of z there you can look at uh, the left hand side of the screen you have the z score formula okay and you compare that for t distribution z now becomes t the rest more or less the same okay for proportions okay i introduce p with a hat okay z equals to p with a hat minus p okay divide by square root of p in bracket 1 minus p okay close bracket divide by n so if the question okay instead of giving you means of population means of uh, sample the 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 question state okay proportion instead so in that case you can do hypothesis test for large sample in term of proportion okay so basically what i discuss with you is only one type of test for large sample using normal distributions for mean one mean that is the most left hand side formula okay eventually you will come across large sample test for normal okay for proportion and then you also have okay the same test for small sample using t distribution the same formula also for one sample okay the next part okay of hypothesis testing is when you have two samples okay for two samples okay it's possible to discuss okay the student t distribution for two sample the proportion test for two sample as well as okay uh, the two means tests for normal distributions we are still discussing uh, step four hypothesis testing okay this is a recap of what we discussed so far so in step four okay this is where you're supposed to make decision and then you need to conclude okay how do you make decisions it's not that tough okay what you need to do is actually compare the critical value in step two and the task statistic okay in step three yeah, you already calculated okay you make your decision by comparing okay the critical value from step two as well as the test statistic from step three okay in this case okay let's consider the first scenario if the test statistic is less than the critical value so you say that your decision is fail to reject ho okay so fail to reject ho it means that you can conclude that there is no significant evidence at the five percent level okay on the other hand if the test statistic is greater than the critical okay you can reject hash not okay and then you can conclude that there is significant evidence at the five percent level okay in the in the current chapter 13 okay i'm going to extend a little bit of our discussion instead of discussing okay hypothesis testing for one population in terms of means we are going to make inference okay by comparing two population so this is still about hypothesis testing except that now you have two samples or you have two populations and you need to compare them okay in the current part okay where we need to compare two populations let's look uh, let's look at the previous one where we look at the technique to estimate and test parameter for one population so it's possible that we discuss population mean okay we use symbol mu or we discuss population proportion okay p okay so we we will still consider this parameter when we are looking at two populations however now our interest will be the difference between two means or the difference between two proportions instead of one okay when we discuss the difference between two means okay let's look at the current uh, diagram on the screen 
In order to test and estimate the difference between two population means, we draw random sample from each of two population. Initially, we will consider independent sample, that is sample that are completely unrelated to one another. So from the population one, okay, with parameter mu one and uh, variance sigma square one, okay, you are going to get okay a sample of a certain size n one with sample statistic x bar one and variance s square one, okay, and then when it comes to the second population, totally unrelated, the same thing, okay, populations two for example, you are going uh, with parameter mu two and variance sigma square two. We are going to draw the sam uh, a sample of size N2 with sample statistic S bar 2 and variance okay, S square 2. Okay, and so on and so forth. Okay, in the hypothesis testing for the difference between two means, because we are comparing two population main, we are going to use the statistic X bar 1 minus X bar 2. Okay, this is the sample statistic values, which is unbiased and a consistent estimator of mu1 minus with mu2. Before we go further in terms of doing hypothesis testing for two uh, population means, let's look at the characteristic of the sampling distributions of x bar 1 and x bar 2. Okay, the first one is that x bar 1 minus x bar 2 is assumed to be normally distributed if the original populations are normal or x bar 1 minus x bar 2 is approximately normal if the population are non-normal but however the sample size are large okay so in this case n1 and n2 each of them are respectively greater than 30. the second characteristic is that we the expected value of x bar 1 minus x bar 2 is uh, represented by mu1 minus mu2 and the third thing is that the variance of x bar 1 minus x bar 2 is given as uh, sigma uh, square 1 divided by the sample size 1 plus sigma square 2 divided by sample uh, size number 2. And the standard error is the same thing except that now we take the square root of everything. How do we make inference about mu 1 and mu 2 based on x bar 1 minus x bar 2 just now? Okay, since x bar 1 minus x bar 2 is normally distributed if the original populations are normal or x bar 1 minus x bar 2 is approximately normal if the population are non-normal but the sample size are large then we can use our new uh, test statistic formula for z. Okay, uh, bear in mind this is an extension of our original z-score formula. So instead of x minus mu, what you have now is because we have two uh, means, so you have first part x bar 1 minus x bar 2 in bracket and you did that with mu because we have two mu, so we have in bracket mu 1 minus with mu 2 and then you divide the standard error in terms of square root of sigma 1 square divided by sample size plus sigma 2 square divided by the second sample size. So this is the standard normal or approximately normal random variable. We could use this to build the task statistic and the confidence interval estimator for mu1 minus mu2. Okay, so to find the difference between mu1 and mu2 actually. Except that in practice, the, the z statistic is rarely used since the population variance are unknown. Okay, so population variance is referring to sigma 1 square, sigma 2 square. So because of this, what we need to do is use a T statistic. Okay, we then consider two cases for the unknown population variance when we believe that they are equal and conversely when we believe that they are not equal. We are still discussing the uh, test statistic okay, for uh, two pop uh, population means. So in this case, the test statistic for mu1 minus mu2 in the case of equal variance, okay, you need to calculate sp square okay sp okay the small p there is referring to the pool variance estimator okay you can see that the formula is given as sp square is equals to the first sample size minus one multiply with uh, the variance for one okay plus okay uh, the, the second sample size minus one multiply with the second variance okay that is the numerator and then you have the denumerator in terms of the first sample size 
plus the second sample size, you minus with 2. Okay, you put this in the formula. So you have that the standard error now, it become, okay, the numerator is still the same for t. So what you have now is the denumerator, okay, square root of s p square, okay, in bracket 1 over n1 plus 1 over n2 close bracket. So the v, okay, uh, which equals to n1, uh, the, sub, the first sample plus the second sample size minus with 2 is what we call as degree of freedom. So remember in part 2, when I introduce to you the student T distributions, we come across degree of freedom. So same thing when it comes to test statistic for mu1 minus mu2 in the case of equal variance. Okay, we are using T statistic now. So you must have degree of freedom. Degree of freedom is usually n minus 1. But in this case, because we have 2n, so we have n1 minus 1, we have n2 minus 1. So you combine them, what you have is, uh, what you have is n1 plus n2 minus with 2. That is the degree of freedom. Let's consider what I already discussed with you in terms of hypothesis testing for two population mean just now into uh, one example. So in this case, okay, we have a bank which is concerned about the increase in the number and the amount of bad debts as a result of the recessions. So a small random sample of debts in 1990, this is a bit outdated of course, and in 1992 are selected. The relative size of the samples for the two years is proportional to the total number of debts. The distribution of debt means Median, standard deviation, and sample size are given below. Okay, for my example just now, so you have for the year 1990, the mean debt is uh, 16,500, while the median is 8,600. Standard deviation from the sample in 1990 is given as 19,800, while the sample size is 76. Okay, that's for the year 1990. Okay, on the right hand side of the screen, you will see that for the second sample, okay, for the year 1992, the mean now is 22,100, median is 11,300, standard deviation from the sample is 23,700, and the sample size now is a bit larger, which stood at 102. Okay, if you want to do this test, okay, let's look at what the questions want you just now, uh, okay, now. So in this case, in part A, the question is asking you test whether there has been a significant increase in the mean debts, okay, from 1990 to 1992 at the 5% level of significance. Okay, so from the question itself, you know that significant increase, so it tells you that, you know, this is a clue for you to know that this is a one-tail test. So the critical value okay uh, for you to decide whether to accept or to reject okay will be positive 1.64 that five percent level rejection region should be on your right hand side and you replace the, the value just now okay uh, in the tables into the formula you are going to get z equals to 1.715 okay so we compare this okay 1.715 okay z equals to 1. 7 y is definitely greater than 1.64. Because of that, you reject hash not. So you have, okay, significant evidence that there is increase in the mean debt at the 5% level of significance. So you must do the steps of hypothesis test one by one. Okay, lay out what is the hash null, what is the hash one. Okay, what are the critical values? What are the test statistic? What is your decision with regards to hash not? Okay, and then what does it mean? It comes to conclusion. Okay, in the second part, okay, it's supposedly be there. Suppose that, the, uh, okay, you are asked to test whether there has been a significant increase in the proportion of debts over 20,000 ringgit. Okay, so in this case, I change the question. Instead of talking about two means, now we are talking about increase in the proportion of debts. Okay, so in this case, uh, you are given, okay, the proportion for sample 1, 0 0.2 and the proportion for uh, sample 2 is 0.3 respectively. So in this case, you want to test, okay, the proportion of debts over 20,000. Okay, the critical uh, 
uh, value will be uh, the same thing, one tail test, okay, at 1.64. The test statistic that you need to calculate using the formula for two proportion, you are going to get, if you do this, Z equal to 1.51. So the decision will be 1.51 is less than uh, the critical value at one tail, which is 1.64. So you will be uh, uh, deciding to fail to reject HO. So fail to reject HO, that means there is no significant evidence to say that there is significant increase in the proportion of deaths of a 20,000 ringgit. So you have to do this in order for you to know, uh, to uh, lay out clearly the, the first step of hypothesis testing. This is the calculations, okay, for part A just now, when the question has been asking about has there been a significant increase in the mean deaths? Okay, so you need to replace the value that you get from the table that is given. Okay, put that into the formula. Okay, solve the formula. You have the critical value of Z, 1.715. Compare that with the critical values. Basically, we are done now with discussions of uh, hypothesis testing. Okay, my emphasis okay, throughout our discussion today is about the four step of hypothesis testing. Okay, or you can call it five step if you split the decision in step four and the conclusion in step five. Okay, it's always you step you, you start with step one, okay, H naught and H one, step two, the critical values, step three with the test statistic where you need to compute, step four you need to decide, okay, and then step five where you need to make conclusions. And then remember it's possible to have tests for one sample. Okay, okay, and then it's all possible to have tests for two samples, and then you can have tests for means, tests for proportion, and then you have tests for large sample. Throughout the discussion, I emphasize on uh, normal distribution that is large sample test, and then you have the small sample test using student t distribution. So the formula will be in terms of t. Okay, so other uh, resources that might perhaps Okay, uh, improve your understanding of our discussion so far with regards to confidence interval in part 2 which is very much related to what we are doing today in terms of hypothesis testing. So you can look at okay, this uh, URL that I list out on screen. So we are done now with part 3 of uh, JKE 316E, okay, quantitative economics. Basically, you have covered with me okay, hypothesis testing. Okay, and the next topic they'll be covering will be from chapter 16 to chapter 17 where we are going to discuss okay, the topic of regression as well as correlations. Thank you for being with me. Okay, I hope you will start doing on the exercise okay, by looking at the questions in the textbook. Okay, you need to try the manual calculation as well as using the uh, software, okay, the Excel and on. And I hope that you will try your best okay, in order for you to understand the hypothesis testing okay better okay thank you and okay keep on studying